I am extra, extra, extra excited about the conversation that we're going to be having today because the person coming on the show has been someone that is a mentor to me. If you've ever listened to my show, seen me speak on stage, there's been a huge influence for me studying the works of a lady that has really changed the game on how to level up the way that you speak, present yourself, and truly motivate the masses. For those who are more familiar with her, Mathilde would already know that I've plugged in the name of her organization that has inspired millions of people around the world to speak their truth, to impact the world, and understand the power of the voice to truly make movements happen to transform whether it's things that you want to see in your community in your family or around the world with influencing organizations government parties whatever it is your voice is the tool that makes that happen so how do we unleash that power how do we use it effectively and what power does it hold when you truly use it effectively is what you're going to be using and learning when we have a conversation with the one and only lisa nichols best-selling author of over six books ceo and founder of motivating the masses and has a reach that has been impacting the lives around the world. And I'm so proud and excited to have her as a returning guest to the show. Lisa, welcome back. Oh my God, you just kind of, you make that all sound so delicious. I, I buy it all again. I want it all again, just a second time. Thank you for your acknowledgement. Thank you for um, just seeing who I am and my contribution and for eloquently putting it and packaging it so wonderful. So I appreciate it. I have to say, I blame you for it. I mean, <laughs> I've well, I've witnessed you, and we've known each other for over a decade now, and that's when I'm. We have. I, we go way back. I know, right? And the time yeah. flies so much. Like I, I'm at a point where I can confidently have a lot of people that are in my life and I've known for a decade, and that's that's like I'm seeing how they've always shown up consistently, and you're one of those people. Like from the first time I've seen you on stage to how you've continued to level yourself up and how you continuously show up, like you're one of the busiest people I know, which means that you have you have a mission. Like you're you're trying to yeah. put a dent in the universe here. And I'm yeah. I'm kind of wanting to start there. Like what's the fire inside Lisa Nichols that makes you keep going, keep working and keep doing more where most people would probably just chill at this point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am um, yeah, you're so right. Like I I have a fire in my belly and that fire it doesn't go out. It keeps getting bigger. Um and I think it keeps getting bigger cuz I'm seeing evidence of the wildfire starting, you know, it's just, it's a wildfire starting and I'm not the only one holding the torch anymore. And that is um, really teaching people how to make unfathomable goals possible, like just radical, just living in radical, just what does that look like on every level? How can you love the perceivingly unlovable, forgive the perceivingly unforgivable, do the perceivingly what can't be done? Um, and how can you move mountains with your message, whether it's in a boardroom or whether it's on a beach or whether it's in a church or whether it's at a conference, how can you make your dash dance? I'm all about make sure you make your dash dance because you can only do you. And so I'm on fire for helping people to discover and do themselves at the highest level of possibility. Because if you don't do you, you will never be done. And so I, I, you know, and in my, in, in my area of expertise that honestly started Jason as an unconscious competence, I, I gotta be, you know, I'm, I'm humble that people call me a legend in the speaking industry or a goat or whatever they call me, but it was an unconscious competence, the ability to move and inspire a room. It just would happen uh, in 2007 after being in the secret and in the secret, everything I touch kept turning to gold. I kid you not. And it was an unconscious competence that I then looked at and made a conscious competence. And then I went on to go, I don't want to keep gifts like this and blessings to myself. How can I teach others? And so I, I'm a true wounded healer. And I say that in that some of the things that I was pained with the most some of the insecurities and the questions and the limiting beliefs that I had to climb over, uh, some of the things I wondered, I am on fire to help other people uh, discover their version, climb over their, their, discover what's on the other side of their greatest fear or on the other side of their greatest procrastination. So, you know, I'm a change agent and I mm -hmm. want my dash to dance and 
at the more people I see dancing because of something I did with my dash, the more people I want to see. So, uh, you know, I don't even know the word retirement when you're doing it this way. Like, yeah. And and this is so wonderful to hear, which makes me want to expand on something you've already said, which is um, you, you mentioned and labeled yourself wounded healer, and you talked about being unconsciously competent. And here's a weird thing I've noticed with a lot of the best speakers I've seen, and yes. I've seen that within my own story, is... I was the guy that, you know, I had that story in university where I had to do a, a presentation of a business case and I was holding a piece of paper and I was so nervous that the shaking of the paper could be heard by everyone in the room. And for those who are watching this on video, you'll notice that I have one of the whitest complexions you've ever seen, Hi. which is a problem because when you're very uncomfortable, you turn like a lobster. And so I was that little lobster that was shaking at the front of the room and I couldn't speak. Well, and then I decided, hey, I need to do something about this and get better. And now people think I've always been a natural speaker. Lisa, I look at you and I'm like, you've always been a natural speaker. So what's the story behind your development for somebody who be wants to become a speaker and the journey that you need to go through to become a great one? Yeah. So first off, I don't want to... Um... I was always a motivator, and my father used to have to remind me as a child, sweetheart, use your powers for good. So I was always someone who could corral the masses. Um, but the first time I took a speech class, I got a D minus. And my speech teacher said to me before, you know, showing me my grade that I almost failed. I didn't. He said, you're not passing. You almost failed. He said, I recommend, he goes, Miss Nichols, quote unquote, Miss Nichols, I recommend you get a desk job and you never speak in public. And so I was very dutiful. I was very dutiful, Jason. I got a desk job and I tried my best to not speak. And someone watching this, you may, you may know what I mean, or someone else of some level of authority gives their limiting opinion of who you are or who you are not. And I had to work really hard to shrink to fit. And um, and then I just began to discover that my unconscious competence was the ability to connect with people. And while educators and uh, corporate CEOs and entrepreneurs and individuals who are speaking, while they're responsible for delivering content, ultimately, we all want to connect with people. I mean, that's just who we are. And while I didn't have these formal speaking guidelines or this formal speaking training, and I officially got a D minus the last time I took a class and speaking, I knew I knew how to connect with people. And so I began to look at the power of connection. And then I began to study the power of having similarities, how when people can see themselves in you, then that actually builds your credibility to them. It's not about your MBA or your BA or your PhD. While that may matter in some circles, and I'm sure it does, and I don't want to discount that, credibility also comes from similarity. Mm. Credibility comes from people knowing that you not only know what you're talking about, but you know them and you know where they're coming from without having the time to hear everyone tell their story. And so I begin to hone in on the skill set of allowing the room to see themselves in me. And it was driven home when I was 33 years old, just a few years ago, joking. When I was 33 years old and I was speaking in Los Angeles and there were about 400 people in the room. And when I finished speaking, this uh, gentleman walked up to me and he said, I, I was 33. He said, I am a 65 year old white Jewish man and you are my twin. <laughs> and I didn't quite understand it in the moment, but then I began to see it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And I realized, oh, okay, there's an ability to allow people to see themselves. So that's the primary thing is that people can see themselves in you. The, the next thing, the third thing is that you are able to show a sense of vulnerability because what it says is I'll put some skin in if you put some skin in and I'll put some skin in first. And you've seen me do it hundreds and hundreds of mm -hmm. times where I put skin in and then the room kind of goes, are we about to do this? We're about to do this. And they put some skin in. Now, mind you, I put skin in in investor meetings. I put skin in in boardrooms. And it's not about getting emotional. It's not about telling too much personal. It's simply about understanding how do you strategically 
put some skin in and then take it back out and watch the room match you there. And so there are some, and, and here's the, here's the beauty of this. This works in the boardroom and this works with your children. Mm -hmm. This works at a conference and this works at a family reunion. It's one of those universal speaking techniques that, and we call it the, the, the audience connection formula. And there's a formula. I have 16 different formulas that make up what I call the science of speaking. And I worked with you guys years ago, sharing with your community uh, where you were previously the science of speaking. And I've evolved it since then even. And so there's these techniques that people don't even know can be done. And when you put them together, they, they sound like music. I mean, it's like a, it's like a beautiful symphony. It's like listening to your greatest artist on the piano. It's a John Legend moment. It's an Alicia Keys moment. You know, it's the greats moment when you put them together. And what comes out is this room feels like they 500 people or five people or 50 or 5,000. They feel like they just met their new best friend. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's a pretty amazing set of skill sets that once I moved it from my unconscious competence to my conscious competence, then I spent five years trying to hone it and construct it in a way where I could give it to other people so that it didn't die in my belly. I didn't want it to die in my belly. I don't want it to die with me. I want to give it away to as many people as possible. Mm. Well, I'm looking forward. I want to unpack a couple of these. And first off, I just want to give an invitation for everybody tuning in. If you want to go deeper into your speaking, we've actually arranged something where if you go into the description, we put up a link for motivating, motivatingthemasses.com forward slash selling with love. There's actually a five day legendary speaker challenge. It's free. It's live. Uh, and if you're watching this episode right on release date, you still have some time to be able to listen to that. And so we highly encourage you to go register if you want to go deeper in this field. But I want to be able to touch on some of these elements for those of you who are listening to this passively. So we'll remind you towards the end of the podcast exactly what's happening out there. Uh, Lisa, that makes me want to unpack the first part, okay? Because you talked about being able to connect with everybody in the room. And when it's when it comes to vulnerability, I think I, I can understand that one well. Like you're, you're showing a part of yourself and you're, you're not holding back and you're showing your true self and maybe even some of the things that aren't all, you know, sunshines and rainbows. You're you're exposing some of the pieces of you that might be a little more edgy, a little more sensitive, and it makes people realize that, hey, you're human too. We're all human. We connect. But you, you also spoke about how you're when you're able to connect with the entire room, I'm wondering, is this an activity of doing any kind of research? Is there some key things you were supposed to prepare if we're doing a talk when it comes to who we're delivering the talk to that makes us more effective to be able to connect with the room? So that's a great question, Jason. And um, your your message, whether your message is five minutes or it's 50 minutes or it's five hours, should have a construction to it. And there are some parts of that construction, research is the best and facts and clarity. And then there's some parts where it's simply about curating your story and your experience where we all can deliver the same content. We all can go grab a book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey or The Success Principles by Jack Canfield or anything, right? We can grab that content and we can repurpose that content and honor their legacy, honor their lives by teaching their content. But no one has lived your story. So when you look at the construct of an effective message, again, whether it's three minutes, 30 minutes, three hours, or three days, there's this construct, this skeleton, this formula, this framework that you want to have. And part of that framework is you want to give clear content, right? But the other part is you want to give impactful, relatable stories that you don't research, that you follow this formula and you develop an effective story. Now, without having it behind me and to show you, I call it the valley technique. So if you think about a valley, you've heard about this before. I taught you this uh, years ago. You've mastered it now. You're amazing now. So if you look at a valley, you have a peak, you have a low point and you have a peak right? So if you're going to tell a story, tell a story like a valley. Always tell, That way you don't get lost in it. Most people get lost in the first peak 
they they stay there way too long or they they get swallowed up in the valley and they can't get out and they go way too long. So when you follow this formula, which I'm so excited that you mentioned the challenge because I'll be teaching this formula and the challenge in details. I will have slides. <laughs> I will have things that you can look at, things you can fill in. It'll be a lot, a, a, a lot easier to follow. But in the valley, you talk about the big you, let's say 30 seconds. And you do it in a way that comes across very humble. I'm blown away. I'm blown away that I have seven bestsellers. This is the big, the big, the big me. So it's the big you. I'm blown away. I'm amazed that my brand touches over 80 million people a year. Big me. I'm blown away that I'm the CEO of a multi-million dollar business that serves globally. Big me. Now, now the valley. Watch this. I'm blown away because it wasn't always that way. There was a time, true story, <laughs> you know, there was a time when I was broke and broken. There was a time in 1994 when I wondered, how did I get here again? How is it that my son doesn't have resources? I don't have resources to buy my son pamphlets. How is it that I'm on government assistance? How is it that I need food stamps to feed my baby? See the valley? I'm in the valley. And you're down here for, let's say, two minutes. Remember, 30 seconds, two minutes. And now you come back up. And I told myself in 1995, I will never be this broken, broken again. And that's why I'm so committed to teaching anyone that I can how to transform your life into something barely recognizable. So what I just did was I did the big meat for credibility. I did the valley for relatability. And then I did the why for why I do what I do. So when you ask the question research, yes, research the parts where you're giving content, you get information, but break up your content with a story. What you've seen me do hundreds of times on stage is I give clear points and then I do a story. Then I give clear points and then I do a story. What it does is it gives texture to your entire message. Now, that's true if you are on stage or if you're on social media. It's, it's true everywhere. It's never not the formula. <laughs> Only never not, double negative. It's never not the formula. Everywhere <laughs> you go, if you want to keep people engaged, how speakers lose their audience or find themselves disconnected from their audience is that they stay in content way too long, mm -hmm. long thinking that they're confirming their credibility. But instead, mm -hmm. oh, they are boring the audience after a while because we don't know the human. We don't know the you. And so um, I hope that answered your question. I, I know I went, went about it a different way, but I, I, I want to teach people how to reconstruct what a, a average an ordinary message to construct an extraordinary message. I love that you went there, Lisa, because I have to share a story of listening to you share some of your talks using that formula. I know them. I know a lot of your amazing stories because I've seen you over 10 years at so many stages. And every time I hear them, they're always a little different. And every time I hear them, I do relate to them. And it's so strange. I don't have any children. But you'll share a story about how it was like raising your child, having to buy the diapers and going through that dip. I never went through that experience. So why would I have empathy if it's not a direct story I can empathize to? But it's incorrect. No, I can empathize to it, even though I didn't experience that. And that brings the relatability, even if I've went through that personally myself or not. And so... The, the question of how to connect with an entire room is when you use that formula with the valley, you get to reach out to everybody because we've all experienced highs and lows in various aspects of our life. And so I've seen myself be drawn into your message. I've seen myself drawn into every one of your talk using examples that I haven't directly experienced yet. I yeah. still found myself relating to you. And yeah. you speak May about the power. Let me quick oh, about that. Please do. There's one technique that I'm doing while I'm doing the valley that gets you and that technique is called scooping. So there's an actual technique called scooping 
and what I do when I'm telling a story to grab you. Someone who we have probably 20 years difference in age, different gender, different nationality, and different place of origin, and you don't have children. The way that I grab you, and it's a technique that I teach, is called scooping so that my story becomes our story. I just wanted to tell you that. So there's a technique inside the technique. So the valley also has scooping inside of it. Yeah. Ooh. Is there is there a little line you could give us as how a scoop would happen so we could at least nibble on something here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So scooping is a little more advanced. Normally my students who've been on my campus at the basic level learn the basic techniques. And then the next level is scooping. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little advance, uh, which is why you haven't heard it a lot, because you got to cover the basics. So scooping is this concept called open, opening the door so that your audience can fit into your story. And where you open the door is not with the details of the story. Watch this but with how the details made you feel. What you weren't realizing, Jason, was the reason why you were feeling connected to me, because I was, I would say things like, all I wanted to do was provide for my son. Any one of us as humans, you want to be able to take care of your basic needs. You want to be able to know that you are valuable. And in that moment, I felt like I was failing myself. I was failing my dreams. And I knew like I knew like I knew in that moment that failure wasn't an option for me. And so I'm in the story, but I'm explaining how I feel. And what happens in the scooping process, Jason, is you go back to a time when you what felt that same feeling. I'm glad I pushed and scooped that little technique from you because I yeah, had you, not noticed it. But yeah, you pulled, that, you pulled that one out of me. <laughs> well, I think it's so great. I'm very grateful because this is one of the elements that I'm thinking about when telling stories uh, that I would always be afraid of telling a story that is so specific to me. But this at least expands it to make you feel like, okay, I can connect with the entire audience. And that makes me want to pull on the whole concept of storytelling. And you were talking about how you can get lost in the content. I know I've done that many times because of my insecurity uh, as a speaker. And that insecurity is, oh my God, if I don't give enough content, they'll not think that I'm giving them enough value. And there are times, and I'm, I'm someone who's got quite a lot of experience as a speaker. I still have a bit of that fear. And what I've always noticed in my own presentation is when I am disproportionately using stories and disproportionately giving less of what I consider the meat, the content, I get disproportionately high reviews of my speak. And I'm like, this is, this is strange. There's almost a discomfort I have to face about how much I'm holding back on content and how much I really need to press on stories. Now, is that this might be something that's maybe unique to my personality type, or is this a, a great roadblock you're seeing with a lot of the students? And is there the what's going on here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're 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 super extraordinarily the like most super achievers, uh, like most content providers, and most professionals who are. Um, they're world-class in what they do, so they want to give it all. Uh, I work with a lot of doctors, and oh, asking them to dial back on the content is like saying, can I please pull out your right side of your mouth, all the teeth with no Novocaine? Like, they're like, no. Oh. So when I'm working with doctors or CEOs or lawyers, and they want to deliver a speech, and they'll say, Lisa, I'm delivering a 30-minute speech, can you help me deliver? So we, I, I draw a line and I say, okay, great. You were draw a line. Here's your 30 minute speech, five minutes for an opening. Let's make it funny or engaging or sincere or acknowledging. So there's some choices you have on your opening. And then from your opening, let's go right into a quick story so that the people listening know why they should listen to you, but who you are. Then let's go into, in a 30 minute message, let's do about nine minutes of content. And then let's do another story. And then let's do another nine minutes of content. And then let's do a really heart centered close. And they go, I'm speaking for 30 minutes. You want me to do 18 minutes of content? 
And I go, yeah. Now your whole experience, see your whole experience as a speaker isn't about content. Your entire experience as a speaker is about connection. And when you make connection, you give contribution in content, but you give contribution in relatability. You got two responsibilities as a speaker. Most people think as a speaker, their job is just to deliver that, that content so that they can prove that they are the expert about that topic. And so, uh, yeah, you got a lot of company with you. A lot of people. I do, um, I do small, intimate masterminds at my house with a very few people. And I got to twist their arms the most because they are the premium leaders of all leaders. And they think that in order to get better, they have to teach more. And I always say, no, in order to get better, you have to peel more off. You have to reveal more. You got to craft that story and don't try the story on stage. Don't try the story on, don't try the story here first. Literally practice the story. Now, I could tell you any story because I know the peak, I know the valley, I know the top part. Even though it's my story, it needs to be contoured and crafted in such a way that one, you see yourself in it. Two, you are moved and inspired by it. Three, it makes you want to choose me. And four, it maintains my dignity and my credibility while I'm telling it to you. Mm. And so that requires practicing and a great speech should have one, at least one story, ideally two in it. And the story can't be a story that supports you to be smart. Um, a story can't be a story that validates what you know. The story can't be a story that drives home the point of what you're teaching. Now you're using the story to simply make sure you stay smart, mm -hmm. make sure you stay the, the credibility. The story, a great story, takes us back to a time when you didn't have it all together about that subject. One story can be about money. The other story can be about relationships. The other story can be about mindset. But it has to take us back to a vulnerable moment when you were not who you are today. Most people stop there because they don't know how to go to that place. They don't know how to set, they don't, they're nervous about sharing that part of them. And that's what 98% of the students who step on my campus, what they end up walking away learning is I can tell the story in such a way that it increases my credibility with you. Hmm. It increases. See, a great story increases credibility, increases loyalty, and it converts a follower into a student. Hmm. All ties rise. All uh, ties rise and tell it right. I I really appreciate that we're talking about this whole aspect of, of vulnerability. And I want to talk about the stuckness you could find yourself in the dip that you highlighted earlier. Because I've noticed for the journey of going into doing speaking, there's almost a part of self-healing that happens in you giving a talk and you sharing your story. It could almost be considered therapeutic. But I've also seen it be use too much as the platform to do your healing as opposed to trying to transform the audience. And I want I you to speak. I call it therapy. I call it therapy. <laughs> I'd love for you to unpack that and what are the consequences of that and why we should probably not do that to our audience. <laughs> yeah, number one, do your work. Do the work on you so that you can give the audience what they came for. Any audience, an audience of one, even if you're shooting videos. If you're shooting videos at home, it I, I doesn't matter. Do the work, navigate to the other side enough to look back and talk about it. I always say I don't ever talk about a journey that I'm still deeply in because I can't talk about the lesson that I got. Remember when you're doing the valley, a critical part of the valley is your credibility now, is the valley, but it's also the lesson learned. And if you don't have the lesson learned, you don't have the big takeaway. You don't have the, this is how it made me a better person. If you don't have that yet, then it's the story is still in the oven. It's still baking. And some stories bake for 10 months and some stories bake for 10 years. Let that story ha have its full cycle. I say a story is like an unborn child. An unborn child cannot come too early because if it comes too early, the lungs are not built. The heart is not built. The veins are not built. The doctor will say, I need to put you on bed rest so you stay a little longer. We need this baby to keep developing. That's a good story. And mm. people think because they're going through something, they should be talking about it. No, 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 no. There's about 
40 other things you've already gone through. Talk about those things. Navigate and get through this and then turn around and talk about it. I, I once I once lost an employee because I was going through a fraud. Someone had frauded me and I was really sad. I was I, I went through this like a month where I was just shocked and I was just hurt. And um, this employee thought I should immediately talk about it and felt like I was a fraud because I wasn't. And I said, I would do no service to my audience if I talked about it now, because all I am is hurt and pissed off. That's it. So so there's nothing I can give them to rise their their consciousness, to raise their consciousness. But when I get through this, I'm happy to talk about it. And so um, I want to invite you, if you're listening to us, I, I want to invite you to give an audience comes to be inspired. And oh, by the way, getting through a story is not talking about a story that goes down, down, down. And in the last 30 seconds, in the last 10 seconds, you go, but it's all good. <laughs> you, there's, there's a responsibility to bring me out and take me up to a place where you know my stories. My stories can have you sobbing. My stories like turn your heart up. But by the time we end, baby, by the time we end, you, I believe I can fly or this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Whatever it is, you have a responsibility. And if you don't have enough time to bring us all the way out, then choose a different story. Choose a different platform. There's a huge responsibility on that. I work with a lot of pastors and I work with a lot of spiritual teachers showing them how to leave your service, leave the community that came to watch you on Sunday or Wednesday night, leave them more excited than they came and not just, I believe in, in whatever the higher power is, but they didn't see enough evidence in the stories. You know, because most time in spiritual environments, people say life is hard. I lost my car. A dog died. I got divorced. But God is good. And our responsibility is to take people out with enough time to leave them in a high. And you can't take your audience live on video, on cell phone. So you can't take any audience where you are not yet. Mm. And so choose the journey you want to share. And I got to I got to be very transparent with you. I wanted to share the story of navigating through being physically abused and being diagnosed as clinically depressed after that. And every time I went to tell the story, Jason, I realized that I still had I was like <laughs> I still had some stuff in me. I was angry, I was still scared. And every time I went to tell the story and I practiced the story in the mirror at home, I'd go to tell the story. I'd stop and go, oh, it's still baking. Mm -hmm. I'd go to tell the story again. I'd stop and go, oh, it's still baking. I did that for nine years before I went to tell the story and I didn't feel that twinge. Uh, I didn't feel that, that, that anchor pulling me down. I said, oh, now it's ready. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, I just got taken on a journey, so back to my seat now. Just the way that you're speaking on this platform, I can see the effects of your storytelling and how it's like bringing us the points. It's telling a story. It's engaging with us in a powerful way. And you're dropping these hints of content that are so perfectly weaved inside the story. So I'm going to pull out a couple here. For one, we talked about how we need to practice. We talked about how maybe going on stage with a fresh story is not the best idea, but you spoke about speaking in the mirror as one of the first spaces to practice. And I'm thinking here from a, a field that we might be much more familiar with is like a comedian doesn't go on his, uh, his Netflix special and drop a joke for the first time. Uh, there's kind of stages to that. And if I understood this correctly, you start with the mirror, then what are your, your usual practice stages that you would go to until something yeah. is ready? Yeah. So me, because I know the formula and what I now teach my students uh, is I have a formula framework. Um, I don't want you to do it the way I did it. I did it hard. Right. <laughs> my job is to save you time, save you stress, save you money to help you turn years into months and months into weeks and decades into days. Ideally. Right. That's that's the power of community. So um, 
the way I did it was one crazy way. The way I recommend people do it now is use the framework because what it does, I got this, and you haven't even seen this. I created this since we worked together. So I'm really excited about it is it asked the question, what year was it? And you write that down. What was the weather like? And was it sunny? Was it foggy? Was it, what did the trees look like? Describe yourself. Now, this is a setup. This is a setup because if you fill out all of this stuff, the next one is what happened that hurt you? What category was it in? Relationship, love, health, finances, mindset, self-belief, and you decide which one. What was the incident? How did you feel? Watch this. What was going on in your head when it happened and afterwards? My what God. did you learn? How are you using that now? I can literally, Jason, have you stand up and I do this and go, now, just make that a story. Just tell me. So now what you end up saying, I wish I had a piece of paper. You end up saying it was 2005 fall. The leaves were, were red and orange. I, at the time, was 40 pounds heavier. I, I wore my Afro colored with auburn on the ends and dark brown at the roots. Like I asked you stuff, what would your hair look like? What would your skin look like? I remember the day, because we have the date. It was May 16th. And he walked into my room and he said, I don't want to be here anymore. Now I asked, how did you feel? My heart sunk. I felt lost. I felt angry. What went through your head? My head was spinning. What do you mean you don't want me anymore? We have a wedding coming up in five months. The invitations are out. My head was screaming. I'm going to be so embarrassed. So the way I create now and the way I invite you to create is fill out a framework so that you know you don't miss any of those things. And if you're listening to me, write this down. That moves a story from a tell me story to a show me story. Because really, no one wants to be told a story. They really want to be showed a story. So nowadays, I follow my own stuff. I don't, I have to go back and do it the way I used to do it. I literally have these pieces of paper and I just go, oh, let me, let me it's, it, fill out the framework. And once I fill out the framework, I'm anchored in all the details. And now I layer the emotion and the energy over the details. It also tells me how I can get in and out of a story in seven minutes or in mm -hmm. five minutes or in 11 minutes. And I can tell how long that story is going to tell me to take, which helps me to develop my content mm -hmm. on each side. So that's the way I would recommend it is that you get a framework. And even if you don't use my framework, you know, my students use mine. But also I tell people, just write these details down. What time of the year was it? What year, what year was it? And then what time of the year was it? And then what was the weather like? What did you look like at the time? How much did you weigh? What was distinctive about you at the time? I was just, I had just had Jelani. So I was freshly 62 pounds over my natural weight. It just gives you a visual, mm. right? So um, that's how I do it now. And, and Jason, it's important to create a story that's not attached to anything. Don't try to create a story for this content. Don't create a story for this content. Create the story because it's your story. How many stories do you have? Only about 20, 30 stories. And you, you don't need them all. Just find your best six pack. And then you'll be able to move those stories through your lessons by this other technique that I teach called the bridge. So the, t the story doesn't need to attach to the content. There's this little, what we call a trim tab. You know, a trim tab is the smallest part of a boat on the back of a boat. But when you turn the trim tab, it turns the direction of the entire boat, right? Or ship. So I call it the bridge. And this bridge is a connector between your story and your content. And then the bridge is another connector between your content and your story. And it allows your story to always be pure. Notice how my stories have never changed, no matter what message I gave. And you've never heard me give the same message twice, right? And yet you've heard me share the same story.
Mm-hmm. It's because I always have a different bridge going in and out of it. I, I really like that because you can purpose that story based on what's the context of the presentation. And I've I've applied this very much. And so I'm very, very grateful to that. By the way, you've been sharing a lot of practical stuff on the podcast, which I am grateful for. But I do want to encourage everybody, if you're liking the taste you're getting now and you want to go deeper and have a at least a way that is in a format that's much more conducive to taking these takeaways and putting them into practice, I'm going to invite you once again to go to motivatingthemasses.com forward slash selling with love. Link's going to be in the description where you can actually join a free live five-day challenge, which is going to teach you how to be a legendary speaker. So if that's been on your bucket list and been looking for an opportunity with less friction, this is the one. And if you're listening to this episode right after release, it should still be online. If you're a little later, definitely go and check out everything on motivatingthemasses.com because there's so much there that you can discover. Lisa, I had one more question or two, actually. The first one is rarely related to the concept of being authentic, but professional. And one of the misconceptions I would assume is a misconception, and I'm pretty sure is a misconception, is we're talking about practicing a story. We're talking about extracting from a story. We're talking about using the same story in multiple speeches. And in every time that you share a story and you are delivering it, you're taking yourself through those emotions. And like, you know, I know when I share my my origin story or I share uh, any kind of valley crossing type of story that I, I have within my inventory, I take myself down there. I relive these emotions. I slow down my cadence of speed of my delivery, especially when I get to the more deep parts of that story. But then when I take him back out, I'll follow a lot of the stuff you teach. And my question to you is, when you do that, is there a sense that you're being inauthentic, that you're faking the story, you're faking the emotion? And does that make you be out of you know alignment with your own authenticity if you're telling the same story, but you're allowing yourself to amplify all the emotions through it to be able to guide the audience? What's your opinions on this? Yeah, no, I've been asked this question before. And um, someone said, every time you tell that story about not having pampers for your son, Lisa, you cry. Are you faking the tears? And I, my reply was, no, every time I tell the story about not having pampers for Jelani, I cry as his mother. And so, um, number one, the reason why most people won't share their story the way that's the most impactful, the way you're sharing it and the way I share it, is because they don't want to be available to those emotions right then. So it's extremely courageous, um, and I want to make it the norm for us to make ourselves available to the feelings that we had when we were going through it. And the reason why I always want to touch those feelings, Jason, is because someone is where I was. And the more I give myself permission to touch the uncomfortable feelings, the more people who are either in it, about to go through it, or have come through it, recognize that I'm their right fit person. They can be one or two places, one or three places. They either about to go in it, they're right in it, or they've been through it. And if they're if they haven't been any of those three, they know someone that's had some relatable emotions. So um, I think that it's it's critical that you give yourself permission and the awareness that I can get myself out of the emotion. So that's about being fully emotionally expressed, not emotional, but fully emotionally expressed. And that comes from doing the self work, doing the self-awareness work, doing the self-compassion work. When you can be self-aware, self-compassionate, self-developed, when you do all of that, then you can turn around and look at a younger version of you, go and sit in that space so that you can show the world, show your audience what it felt like to sit there, get back up, walk back out, look back and say, and now because of that journey, I want to teach you. And Mm. when you do it right, they, they get it. And they, and, and even the most cynical audience member goes, Oh my God, (laughs) I was there with you. Um, No, there isn't a sense of fake. There's as long as you don't move into performing Mm. And there's a performance where you're acting it out. And then there's a surrender to the feeling that's there. And you can kind of feel it if you're forcing it. There are plenty of times I tell a story that I have cried over many times and I don't cry because tears aren't there. The tears aren't necessary. 
the authenticity and unpacking the story is. Um, and then inside of the story, if you have the discomfort that they're going to think I'm inauthentic, then stop and say, I never feel comfortable telling the story because I need to let the, I need to touch the emotion again. I say it and people go, oh, like I don't enjoy this. I don't enjoy telling you a story that makes me w cry again. What I enjoy is what happens on the other side of me sharing the story. And I'll, I will say at times when I tee it up that this is one of the stories that impacts the most number of people that I'm probably the least comfortable sharing. And it's not because I'm afraid of being vulnerable, but it's because the emotions all surge through my body again. But someone came for this story. So I'll share it for you. And then I go into it. So when I know I'm sharing a story multiple times, I'll share why. I'll share that it, that, that it costs me every time I tell it. And yet I want to I want to pay the pr piper. I want to pay the price for a breakthrough that could happen in that room. And so you begin to tee it up a little differently. And again, that's the bridge. So my bridge is a little different going into it because the story has been out there in the world. Lisa, there's so much more that I know we can discuss. There's so much you share and just witnessing you in your mode of teaching. I'm like picking up on all the nuggets on your current delivery. And I'm like, oh, I'm noticing these little things you do that are so so professional in the way that you are as a speaker. And I just witnessed that you're so amazing. And I'm so glad that you were on the platform. I know we're a little short on time, but I do need to squeeze the question that I ask every one of my guests, which is Lisa, you're on the selling with love podcast. You're no stranger to sales. You're one of the most effective salespeople I've ever seen. What does selling with love mean to Lisa Nichols? You know, every time you said it, when you would um, give the the URL to my five day challenge. Every time you would say it, I, I took a, I just felt good. It, it felt good. So just know I've been connecting to that title every single time you said it. So number one, I was mortified of sales uh, 25 years ago, mortified, mainly because I didn't know how and because I was sold so many things that I didn't need and I was clobbered with sales so often. So I had been, you know, punched around from sales techniques. And so my relationship to it, it was that it was toxic, it was dominating, it was disingenuous, and it was slimy, and only slimy people did it. And so I, I am going to answer you, I'm gonna answer you, but I want you to know my come from place, because it was very real. And um, initially in my business, I would hire men who were older than me, and who had a what I thought to be a stronger stature than I did, and I would ask them to do the sales because I felt like people would buy from them before they buy from me. And when it failed epically, I had to learn how to sell. And um, uh, selling with love is um, finding the need that you can feel and then becoming dogged about finding the people who have that need and recognizing that your dash here on earth is about being a, of the highest good you can possibly be. So that's the origin is to um, find the need that you can feel, find the problem that you can solve, find the desire that you can help manifest because there's someone looking for you. And your job is to create the bridge from you to them, to let them know that you exist and that you can help them be relieved of that discomfort, mindset or otherwise, or help them achieve that desire. Selling with love is speaking to the dignity of the humanity of the individuals you're speaking to, recognizing that people who are listening to you are brilliant and smart, and they don't deserve or need to be tricked into buying from you. Uh, selling with love is giving people a sample of what you want them to invest in, allowing them to see a piece of the contribution like I have with you today, like Jason does all the time, of how you can help impact their lives and then allowing them to make a decision. Selling with love is saying, it's my job to give you access and it's your job to choose. And ultimately, I'll just end with this. Uh, I did an event once and I didn't sell. This was years ago and I thought selling was slimy and I was gonna do the audience a favor by not selling. 
And I went on stage and I did my thing and I rocked the room and the divine God came through me and just did the, did a great job. And this woman came up to me. I'll never forget her. She was chocolate. She had shoulder length hair and she was wearing all white. And she said, Miss Nichols, where is your table? Oh my God, I cannot wait to get in your program. And I said, with this pompous kind of arrogant, holier than thou energy. Oh, I don't have a table. I'm not here to sell. Other people are selling, but I'm not selling. And this woman's look changed, Jason. She looked at me almost with disgust. And she said, you mean to tell me you're going to crack me open to a new possibility? The way you just cracked me open to a new possibility? and you're gonna send me back to my home empty-handed? And then she walked away. She never said another word, and it was clear that I had let her down because I wasn't making an offer. I'll just end with that. Change my life. All of a sudden, I realized I would be doing a disservice to my audience to open them up to such a new possibility and then not have access for them to choose to jump in and go deeper. She changed my, she changed, changed my life. I'll end on that. Hell yeah. <laughs> That's selling with love right there. Lisa, thank you so much for everything you share. That is a wonderful way of expressing selling with love. That's like touching me at the heart. And that's exactly why I want to inspire people to sell with love because I see how you show up in the way that you teach, in the way that you tell stories, in the way that you speak, in the way that you sell is you know that the offer that you're making is providing so much more value than what you ask in return. And you are bold to express the empathy required to speak the language necessary for them to take action. And I love that about you. And it was a pleasure to have you on the show. And what I want to encourage everybody who is listening in, if you've enjoyed, learned, and want more, motivatingthemasses.com forward slash selling with love, you're going to get a chance to experience a five-day legendary speaker challenge. It's free. It's live. It's with Lisa. And you will not want to miss this. If you're listening to this episode as if it's just released, it's happening at the beginning or in the middle of March. You'll not want to miss this. So please register early. Check it out. It's going to be a fantastic event. And you are sure to learn so much more than what you've touched the tip of the iceberg through the episode today. It was an honor and a pleasure to have Lisa come back on the show. There's so much more we know we can unpack with this woman. But what you've got today was definitely a great sampler. Thank you once again, Lisa, for coming on the show. And for everybody else, go out there, be incredible in the way that you speak. And of course, keep selling with love. Thank you so much for listening to the Selling with Love podcast. We have some previous episodes you can tune into right here. And if you prefer the short form content where you get to the point in under 10 minutes, we do have a ton of clips from our best episodes that are being shared on this channel as well. So pick which one supports you the most. And of course, thank you for liking, subscribing, and of course, selling with love.